Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're discussing Earth Day with leaders of two of the largest animal welfare and conservation organizations in the world. That includes special guests, Azadine Downs, President and CEO of the International Fund for Animal Welfare, and Colin O'Mara, President and CEO of the National Wildlife Federation. Thank you both for joining us. It's, it's, it's wonderful to be there. I'm going to go to you, uh, Azadine, um, but just I'm going, to, I'm going to set this up by saying that this Thursday, this Thursday marks the 52nd celebration of Earth Day, and with over a billion people in 193 countries showing their support for environmental protection, Earth Day is the, lar- is the world's largest secular holiday, something I just learned. So you are a caretaker of this earth. And we have, up until quite recently in human history, taken the earth for granted. It's an infinite resource. We've been able to exploit it. We've been able to extract from it. We've been able to live off of it. But we're beginning to get a a true um, reckoning, understanding that that the earth is finite. finite. So, So let's get oriented on each of your missions, starting with you, uh, Azadine, on the International Fund for Animal Welfare, and then you, Colin, and then we're going to go back and we're going to talk about some of the larger issues, including what you're doing today. But uh, Azadine, could you uh, give us a little orientation on the International Fund for Animal Welfare? Sure. So we were founded in 1969 up in Canada uh, on the, the SEAL campaign to stop the killing of the baby seals. So right before the pandemic hit 2019, we celebrated 50 years uh, of working around the world. We work in 40 countries. And our focus really is on animals and people thriving together in the place that we call home, which is the planet. Um, And uh, we're always looking for examples of where we can focus on the importance of individual animals in conservation. So so my focus has really been to shift uh, some of what we do at the organization, but also looking at the world in general of changing the face of conservation so that it includes the importance of individuals, uh, both wildlife and people living with wildlife. So um, your organization really um, tested this idea of a personal connection to an individual animal. Yeah. That particular campaign going back into the 70s um, really focused on the brutality of the harvest, the seal harvest, yeah. creating that connection. Do you uh, generally take that same approach as you create that, that awareness of, of how humans impact uh, animal ecosystems? And do you also um, uh, focus mostly on, on large animals? We do continue with that with that theme. And the reason I say that, and the reason why I think it's important is that if you look at conservation in general, historically, a lot of times it focused on populations um, and, and the health of the overall population. And the individual animal really had no intrinsic value. But that, that is what I think is important for people today to realize that uh, the history of conservation you know, to be skeptical has not produced the results that we've wanted it to. And I think that the part that was missing was that that human connection. It's very difficult for people to uh, discuss statistics and, and biomass and some of the more complex issues that, that uh, conservation scientists uh, focused on for so many years. Uh, and so that, that notion of the individual animal in conservation is something new. And I think that uh, a lot of the mistakes that have been made, you know, when you look at culling of, of elephants, for example, um, that, that they made enormous mistakes and they didn't take into consideration the dynamics of, of family groups, individuals within a population. One of the reasons why I asked um, uh, Azadine that question was to set you up, uh, Colin, uh, because your two organizations take different approaches, very complementary approaches. Talk a little bit about the approach that you take, because you're taking a whole whole ecosystem, flora, fauna. You're, you're not just necessarily focused on that sort of um, um, animal or family group kind of. And, and I'm I, I'm not I'm not just I'm not 
uh, trying to characterize uh, as being um, or put into a box what you're doing, but, sure. but Colin's group takes a, a different and complementary approach. Talk a little bit about your, your approach, Colin. Yeah, no, thanks, Mark. And thanks for having me on today. And as it is, it's great to be with you as well. Um, I mean, like, I mean, we were founded in, in the 1930s when, you know, folks across the country were concerned about wildlife populations, largely game animals, um, kind of falling off the landscape. And, you know, the, you know, at that point we were down to maybe half and half a million white tailed deer, you know, you had, you know, wild turkeys have been kind of extirpated off a lot of the landscape, you know, duck population, particularly the wood ducks and black ducks um, populations were at historically low levels. Um, the bison's are, bison already been shot off the plains, the p- passenger pigeons have been shot out of the sky. And so there was this, this reckon- recognition that um, we needed to have kind of scientific management and well-funded conservation to bring back a lot of wildlife species. But the connection was largely related to either meat or markets um, initially, as opposed to like the, altru- the kind of the intrinsic value of nature itself. And I think the evolution of the Federation, as, as Adine said, you know, for the bigger movement is saying that we want all people to have a connection. I mean, it's not, I mean, of course, and we have millions of members that, you know, hunt and fish and that's great, but we also have, you know, members that like to bird and garden, right? Like just kind of go out and just kind of see the, you know, the amazing reptiles and amphibians or the amazing invertebrates or you know, maybe pollinators in their backyard. And the idea is to try to say that the, when we save wildlife, we save ourselves, that having healthy wildlife populations is not just important like intrinsically from a moral point of view. It's also important from a, it just from, from, even if you don't care about the intrinsic value of nature, the number of, of benefits that we, that we derive by having healthy ecosystems and healthy wildlife populations can't be overstated. You know, it's, it's pollinators that pollinate the food that we eat. It's, you know, it's amazing vegetation that helps clean the water that we drink. It's the, all the, you know, the, the amazing forests and grasslands that help clean the air that we all, that we all breathe. It's the, you know, it's, the, it's all the medicines that have been derived from, that we've learned from, you know, different species. And so, you know, trying to make this case that even though we're living in this incredibly technological age, that, you know, the way to kind of save society and save civilization in many ways, is getting back to nature and protecting the, uh, the amazing creatures, creatures and the biodiversity we've been blessed with. The thing that I think is so interesting about this is that you're, you're both talking about human behavior. So you're talking about changing attitudes um, from being one of taking um, nature for granted, taking um, the abundance of the earth for granted to an awareness and an appreciation that that abundance is limited. Um, I'm going to stay with you, Colin, in terms of, of, the attitudes in the 30s. In the 30s, we were still on the cusp of plenty. We were going into the Great Depression, or we were in the Great Depression, and it was it became obvious at that point with the dust bowls uh, that were blowing through those those areas where poverty was resulting in the encroachment of the national parks as people were trying to harvest wood and 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 um, and animals for sustenance that. We were, we had actually come to the end of the frontier and we were beginning to cannibalize what was, what was, uh, what remained. So talk a little bit about your programs, because when you look through your website and you start to see the prominence of educational resources, for example, and then the various uh, programs that you have, you start to see a structure to create changes in human behaviors. And it seems that the entire organization is really about changing how we encounter nature and to change our, our behaviors from being extractive to being additive. I think there are some parallels to the thirties um, in, in ways that we fully don't um, always appreciate. You know, we had lost you know, a lot of the topsoil because we had you know, chopped down trees and kind of decimated grasslands um, and didn't have those natural systems that provided you know, so much of the bounty that led to like the kind of the, kind of the American, kind of the rise of the American economy in the previous, in the previous decades. Um, you know, we had lost track of a lot of the indigenous knowledge that, you know, obviously, you know, kind of living in harmony with the land. I mean, someone that was lost in this kind of era of conquest, this era of just, you know, kind of cutting down every natural resource as you're trying to, to grow the economy and, and, and build. And, and so today, um, I think it's a little different, but we're also seeing, you know, communities that are saying, look, I, I want to have healthy wetlands because the places that do re- are, are, are able to withstand these horrible hurricanes and flood events and with, with greater resilience, I, the folks that have healthier forests don't have as many kind of mega fires um, that we're seeing kind of ravage the landscape. And so um, obviously there's, there's implications for agriculture and ranching and for, 
and for other, you know, kind of working lands. But I think folks are increasingly saying like, by not having these systems, you know, we, we're also harming our, ourselves. And like the same, and look, in the same, some ways, the same sacrifice zones where communities of color in particular have had to face a lot of pollution over the years are the same ways we've you know, kind of, kind of not taken care of, of uh, the full diversity of wildlife in a way that's affecting communities all across the country. And so I, I think there's this kind of return because folks are seeing that there's a personal benefit and a personal loss if we don't kind of do right by our natural resources and healthy air and clean water. Azadine, why don't you uh, unpack a little bit about how you create changes in us and our behaviors and our perceptions? Yeah. <clears throat> you know, it, it's interesting, and some of it is good news. Um, you, you know, uh, Colin mentioned uh, turkeys and, and some of the other animals that are that are that we see more in an urban landscape and a suburban landscape. So, one of the questions that I I, I ask our own supporters is: Are you willing to share the earth? And, uh, you know, whether or not it's uh, because the animals are invading our space or the reality is, is that we've invaded theirs and they have nowhere else to live. Um, but, you know, when we connect the work that we do in Africa, we have a lot of people around the world who want to protect elephants. They want to protect lions. They want to protect uh, carnivores that are dangerous. And so it is a behavioral issue. And I, one of the things that I ask them is, why are you asking people to live with lions who could kill them and their children when you're not willing to put up with rabbits or turkeys in your own backyard? So, you know, so, so boiling it down to this fundamental question of, are we willing to share the earth? Are we willing to share the space? And a lot of people that I've encountered say, no, I'm not willing. I'm not willing. Uh, well, and that's well, where building and infrastructure and all of those other issues. We're all dealing with this. Um, we have uh, rattlesnakes uh, where where we are, right? Yeah. Um, and um, um, I had a situation where I was trying to remove a rattlesnake and I couldn't. And I ended up killing it. Right? Yeah. Why did I kill yeah. it? Because the rattlesnake was dangerous. Right. And I, I, I don't. I don't know what I what I could have done differently. Rattlesnakes are not necessarily scarce, but is 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 there another way I could have handled that? Is it's just a a, a small example of, of what you're talking about. So what is the answer here? You know, when we when we when we look at these issues of intersectionality, we kind of would have to constrain our own behaviors. I would have to not kill the rattlesnake and take maybe hours to try to figure out. Um, how to to deal with this one solitary creature, and at a certain point, I just decided to kill the rattlesnake. Yeah. Um, yeah. So how do how do I deal with that, Azadine? Um, how how do how do we as a society writ large? I mean, that's a that's a tiny little example. Sure. But how do we deal with it? What what kind of a mechanism is it? You know, in in our work, um, some of these issues come around to land use and, and the sort of the legal frameworks of, of land use. So, you know, in, in Kenya, where, you, where people are living with uh, dangerous animals and the, the, shift, the shift that we, we focus on as well in, in, with indigenous people is that a lot of this wildlife is living outside of these national parks. And so, again, historically, the animals were inside the park, the people were outside the park, the people were locked out of uh, the, the national parks and, and the animals in, in some countries locked in. Uh, but that's not the reality. A lot of these animals are living outside protected areas 60, 70, 80% of their time. And so they're interacting with people. One of the things that we see with the, the Maasai community uh, is land trusts and setting aside 30% of the land that they own or control or manage. Uh, and those spaces are left alone. And so it is a behavioral change of, are you willing to set aside that land? Are you willing to uh, reinvigorate some of the learning and the indigenous learning that was historical that had been lost? And there's issue, issues of, of colonialism. Um, but keeping people safe, you know, I think in the States, and maybe Colin can talk more about this, but, you know, this issue of black bears coming in uh, to, to areas where people live, uh, mountain lions, uh, you do have to change your behavior uh, and you have to be willing to, to share. And that means that you can't have all of the things that you want. 
So part of this is going to be some some agreement that uh, that we're ceding to the collective government uh, some authority. But some of this is going to be our own changes in behavior and attitudes. I mean, that's what um, Azadine is saying, Colin, right? He's saying that, you know, you might have these preserves in this particular case, um, but the preserves are not really the whole answer. It's also our own attitudinal shift. Is that part of how you're shaping your organization, that there's an advocacy piece, but the advocacy piece goes into behavior modification, education, giving, giving me a reason to change my own approach to, to these kinds of problems. Yeah, and I think you've, you've both set it up perfectly. And I love the way as in kind of teed up this idea of just making space for wildlife. Um, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, having folks act locally, but also, um, you know, kind of advocate, you know, either nationally or globally. And, and, there's, and there's opportunity to do both. You know, we run one of the largest backyard habitat programs in the world where, you know, more than a quarter million folks have, you know, planted milkweed or cardinal flowers or bee balm or things in their backyard that allow them to have, you know, support a wide diversity of, of pollinators and, and songbirds, um, you know, increasingly working with, you know, try to have amphibians and other, other species supportive with water and other, other types of features, um, just again, create space. And, you know, when somebody does that, um, they can basically double the amount of biodiversity in their backyard um, within minutes. And they, you could have a windowsill in a city or it could be, you know, acres upon acres in the country. Um, but it makes a huge difference. And at, at, the, at the policy level, um, one of the few things that we're seeing bipartisan support for right now in the U.S. Congress is a bill called the Recovering America's Wildlife Act that we've been working on for several years. And the idea is to fund state level and, and, and tribal led um, conservation that's proactive, that's collaborative, that's non-regulatory, but implementing every state in the U.S. has a, a state wildlife action plan where they identify species of greatest conservation need. And the idea is to help save these species before they require the protections of the Endangered Species Act and also accelerate those, the recovery plans of, of the species that are. Um, but there's, 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 we just need more tools and we've underinvested heavily. Um, a lot of the tools tend to be more regulatory, which, you know, put, put people against each other. And those places where they're absolutely necessary and the Endangered Species Act has been amazing at keeping species in the U.S. from going extinct. Um, it hasn't done as well bringing species back from recovery outside of some you know, great examples like the, Mer the bald eagle and the American alligator and some iconic species because we haven't invested. And you know, this is one of those places where that ounce of prevention, investing just a little bit in, the, uh, in proactive collaborative conservation on the ground is going to make a world of difference for wildlife because it's not, as you said, just about protecting like, the park or like the preserves. We absolutely need those. But movement, connectivity, this idea of like migratory range changes, food changes. I mean, as we're seeing climate shifts, um, we're going to be much more dynamic. It's going to cost money, but it's going to pay for itself many thousand times over um, by making these investments because the cost of inaction is just incalculable. So you're also talking about very little uh, acts and very large acts combined. So uh, planting flowers that help pollinators, um, uh, planting biodiverse gardens or gardens that, that have native species to help native species, native uh, insects, and then up the food chain, uh, thrive. Those are those are small acts. You know, I think back to what uh, Lady Bird Johnson did, uh, the first lady, when she was looking at Texas wildflowers and, and what kind of a, a big impact that has. So little connections of ourselves to nature within the context in which we're living actually changes our own consciousness. And then you have these bigger acts like the Endangered, Endangered Species Act, which um, uh, protects um, large species. But how do we how do we systematize that throughout the economy? Because, you know, when I look at what I order, I order something from Amazon, for example, and a truck rolls up and it's a, it's a gas powered truck, right? And all this logistics that are going on and, and I get my package, my package is, in a, is, in a, is, is placed in an envelope, which is placed in plastic, which is placed in a box, which is placed in a bigger box with paper around it and, and uh, plastic tape around it and so on. And then I, I think about where that all is coming from. Trees are being chopped down for the paper, plastic oil is being used to make the plastic, that all goes into the ecosystem. How do I change all those little acts that are, that are coming in that are going to have the, the impact that I do not want it to have? How do I, how do I start to think about this in a way that, that connects those dots together uh, as Dean. You have other organizations that have a slightly different, different message, but until I be changed my behavior, all of you are just 
burning money and you're not affecting the person who's actually creating the problem. So how do, how do you do this? Do you get me to volunteer? Do you, do you get me engaged in your organization in some way so that I start to, to become much more familiar with the downstream impacts of my own behavior? You know, in our work, we focus a lot on behavioral change. Um, China uh, was a great driver of a lot of the things that you're talking about, including, you know, um, ivory, rhino horn, pangolin scales, all of these things that, that wind up killing wildlife and then hurting the environment. So you get a little veil of, uh, um, vial of something. And it turns out to be a dust from a rhino horn. For that's example. right. Yeah. And so and that's you know, what you see. Yeah, no, and crazy things that rhino horn uh, cures cancer. So, and, and I hear this from government officials, ministers. So, you know, we do a lot of uh, public awareness campaigns in China, and we've seen that um, 80% of the people who were buying ivory, for example, thought that teeth fell, fall out, that the tusk falls out. Once we were able to get across to them that you're actually killing the animal, um, the, the number of people who responded to that poll said you know, dropped to about 36% of people who said they would do. But things that very small things like, like plastic, I would say, I would say that, you know, given what we do and in the United States, but around the world, if, if everyone could take one step to use less plastic and, and look at all of the ways um, that you use it and eliminate it, because it is so destructive to marine life, um, the, you know, I lived in Yemen for years. If every tree, every tree that you could see as you passed by was filled with plastic. So I've lived in places that you see the impact, you know, as opposed to uh, many of us live in very beautiful places and people are clean and they try to clean those things up. But there are things that you can take uh, action on immediately. And, and you know, just to, to finish quickly, the issue of investing uh, in conservation and, and in saving the planet. The, the private sector and the insurance companies and the central banks are moving, whether or not people want them to move or not, or whether companies want them to move or not, they are moving towards a point where they will no longer uh, insure business investments if there's not some mitigation for climate change done. So are that you is what that happened. as well, Colin. That 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 are you seeing that kind of that kind of uh, motion? You know, um, we just finished a couple polls. Uh, the first poll showed that sixty percent of people are going to be celebrating um, Earth Day in some way or recognizing Earth Day in some way, which is really interesting. Although we have a select audience, uh, that sixty percent number is interesting. The other thing that is also very interesting and kind of unexpected. We asked, what are the priorities in your conservation efforts? And we gave people a lot of different choices. The one that got 83% was the, the largest category, which is preserving ecosystems. And by reducing deforestation, coastal, um, uh, coastal development, and so on and so forth, it's the largest category. That 83% saw that, that these large categories uh, merited attention and not just specific issues that relate to them but where they live. That's also interesting. Are you seeing the the trend that um, Azadine uh, sees that that maybe in the banking system and the financial systems in our in our economy people are are shifting? Because I'm not sure that I'm seeing it to the extent that Azadine and his optimism uh, <laughs> seems to see it. How do you see it, Colin? I mean, I, I think we're heading in the right direction, and we still have ways to go. And like, I mean, we've been kind of presented this false choice between was it systemic change or is it individual action, you know, for years. And like, there's been a lot of corporate money trying to say it's your fault, you know, if, you know, if we're not recycling as opposed to getting out of the source production that would reduce the amount of pollution in the system in the first place. But we're at a point now where we need all of it, right? We need like, we need in conscientious investors. We need, you know, folks thinking about the, the downstream consequences of their of their investments, of their business decisions, um, because the, again, the, the you know, extinctions forever and there's not a way to kind of turn back. And I think folks are, so I think there's heightened awareness. Um, I still think, you know, we're, you know, even in the last few months, you know, in obviously living through a pandemic that, you know, likely had a zoonotic 
kind of initial touch point that, that led to the, the, the disease kind of causing this kind of global chaos. And at the same time, having a, a living through a period where a lot of folks turned to nature for both sanity and, and health and everything else, because it was a place of refuge, um, not just for wildlife, but for, for, for all people as well. And at the same time, you know, now we're in the middle of Ukraine, where folks are trying to figure out how to replace you know, Russian oil and gas as quickly as possible. And like, well, what does that mean for the landscape? So it's a complicated landscape. But I'm, I'm excited that like in each of those major cases, kind of climate considerations, even in many cases, natural resource considerations are a much higher part of the conversation than they would have been even a decade ago. You know, in fact, we're talking about like, how do you export more LNG to Europe to displace, you know, Russian, oil, Russian gas, but do it in a way that kind of still maintains our climate commitments. And that's just a conversation that frankly wouldn't have taken place 10 years ago because the natural, national security considerations would have trumped. So I think there's, I'm optimistic, but we still have miles to go. Yeah. Let's let, let's stay with you. And then we're going to go to you, Azdin, because we're, we're coming to the end of our time. So we're going to give you um, uh, the last word. But but Colin, staying with you, um, could you talk a little bit? Could you expand a little bit more on this this idea uh, and, and using the situation in Ukraine as, as an example? We have a crisis that is coming up with and it's a practical crisis. Ukraine uh, grows a lot of the world's uh, food, right? So there will be a need for uh, some sort of uh, redress of that supply cut. Uh, Russia supplies a lot of the world's oil. And so we need to figure out a way if we're not going to feed that war machine uh, to reduce that consumption. And that means since we can't switch to renewables overnight, that means more drilling, more oil extraction. How do we deal with that? Fairly big question. Um, like I, I think, I think at the end of the day, um, I think folks are increasingly connected, increasingly understanding how connected we are with these global supply chains. And I think we saw it with PPE during the with you know masks and, and protective gear during the pandemic, and you know how dependent we've become on China and the need to have more domestic production uh, of a lot of these uh, at least at least more secure supply chain maybe among allies in particular. And on the in the energy side, now seeing the weaponization and like we should have learned this lesson after after nine eleven that energy was being weaponized to kind of fund uh, terrorism in that period. And now obviously we're seeing it to fuel you know the most horrific um, kind of war in the European theater in in you know seventy years. And, and it does come back to being smart about what the transition looks like. You know, I mean, I think the faster we are moving electrifying and the faster we're moving towards, you know, clean energy, the better. And at the same time, uh, being realistic that um, if you're going to be you know, asking folks to switch energy sources and things like that, like it's got to be affordable, it's got to be reliable, it's got to be you know, hopefully moving cleaner um, and having more technologies that are hopefully in, innovated in the U.S. being exported around the world. It's a huge opportunity. But I, I do worry to your point that we see a kind of a dichotomy in the politics where you have, you know, kind of one saying, saying, just drill, baby, drill. And the other side saying, like, just jump to renewables. And like the answer is a little bit of both. Right. We're going to have to have a little more production. We got to mitigate the impacts. That means capturing the methane emissions. That means capturing as much you know, carbon and, and, and methane pollution as you possibly can. So it's as clean as possible because you know, domestic produced energy is cleaner. Um, it's still not clean enough to meet our climate goals, but it's cleaner. And at the same time, we need to double down on the transition towards renewable um, sources and cleaner sourcing, and even just conservation of, of, of energy, using less, using you know, different types of technologies that don't have the same footprint. Um, I, I'm hoping that we can have that thoughtful conversation. I mean, it is worrisome to me that um, you know, tens of billions of dollars over the course of the last several years are what's fueling pretty much the entire Russian war machine at this point. And you know, we have to be doing so like, I'm agnostic for why we make the transition. I mean, I think there's a reason to make it for security. There's a reason to make it for wildlife. There's a reason to make it for health. There's a reason to make it for kind of justice reasons, um, as long as we make the transition. And I think this, this is one of those moments between the pandemic and the war, we're seeing why the kind of the status quo isn't acceptable anymore. So your answer to a great extent is ecosystem thinking. It is exactly why 83% of the people uh, voted for the largest category. It's, it's basically look at the downstream consequences of what we're doing today and, and really start to make different decisions so that the downstream uh, consequences are not constant dependent on, on a polluting energy source. Uh, a, a constant use of plastics, which is a, a polluting sort of um, a packaging of convenience, right? It's, it's basically start to adopt the kind of ecosystems um, thinking that the National Wildlife Federation and 
uh, adopts, but do it in our daily life. Really uh, think before we act a little bit about what, what the consequences can be. And also, don't simply condemn people when they are not willing to make the sacrifice, when we ourselves are not willing to make the sacrifice. We might have to sacrifice a little short-term gain for long-term benefits, right? Yeah, that's right. Azdeen, um, talk a little bit about your view on this same topic. And also, could you, could you, uh, could you please inform us on your work in the Ukraine to uh, help uh, some of the um, organizations that are sure. uh, supporting animals there? Yeah. That, that would be very helpful. Yeah, you know, on ecosystems, uh, you know, the reason I remain positive is because I see that there is serious work in the financial markets on ecosystem valuations and the, the connection to uh, not, not carbon uh, you know, emission reductions, but carbon sequestration. How much is the soil worth? How much is the grassland, uh, grasslands worth? Uh, what, is a, what is a whale worth? in terms of carbon sequestration. And so there's some very in interesting financial uh, mechanisms that are being uh, put forward with social impact investments, bonds, uh, that all are related to we are not separate and apart from the ecosystem, that if we don't do this and if we don't um, if, if we move away from this notion that nature itself must pay for itself and it has no worth otherwise, I think that's why I remain positive because, because the financial market is beginning to see, yeah, th this is a way to, to close that $700 billion gap that, that apparently is required for conservation. On Ukraine, you know, it's interesting that you bring up this issue of, of food and food security too, because, um, you know, related to what, what Colin was saying, is you look at the U.S. and look at the subsidies that are given to the agricultural businesses uh, not to grow food uh, or water use in the West, uh, use it or lose it. And so there's waste. There's waste there. And, and I think that there are solutions that, that, that we can find if we shift some of these policies that, um, you know, are related to, to civil unrest, ultimately, and, and security issues. In Ukraine, what we're doing uh, first and foremost right now is just to try to uh, help the refugees who are leaving, um, and many of them with their animals. Many of them have wild animals, you know, exotic pet trade. There's some, some more complicated issues. Uh, animals that are, that are uh, in zoos that are now being moved out of uh, the Ukraine. So that's what we're focused on in the short term. In the long term, though, we're going to look at uh, the destruction that's been done to the ecosystems, habitat, natural habitats for wildlife. And that's going to be a much longer term issue. Uh, but even, you know, even now working on the Poland Ukraine border, what we're finding is, uh, and it was in the media the last couple of days, more and more Ukrainian refugees on the Mexican border trying to enter the United States with animals that are not being allowed uh, in because of, you know, CDC regulations and, and rabies and things like that. So, you know, politically, there's lots of there's lots of things that happen that are unexpected, as in the pandemic. And what we've learned in the pandemic is that nature will bounce back. Given the chance, nature will bounce back. So, so that's a, a positive note to end with. If we, if, if we help it, you know, there are, two, there are two real lessons here that I think um, I'm taking away. Uh, first of all, I think it's, it, it's so much about our daily human behaviors um, and um, our, our, our shift of mind. And the other, the other piece, which is related to that, is that this is an all-in kind of an effort. You're basically helping to inform us in our business lives, in our economy, in our financial systems, in our civil society systems, how we ought to adjust to integrate this care of the earth. Um, and this sort of dialogue, which previously was sometimes looked on as an argument, um, this dialogue needs to unfold because it, hap it, 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 it will affect us whether we have the discussion or not. If I am a farmer, it's going to affect us in terms of availability of water in the West. Or if, uh, if I'm living in a wildfire area, there might be fires uh, in certain places. It might be uh, difficult for, for uh, me to 
uh, as a hunter, find the game that I'm looking for. If we don't take care of the ecosystems, no matter where we are, it's going to affect us. So we really have to start thinking about this very holistically. Azadine Downs, President and CEO of the International Fund for Animal Welfare, Colin O'Mara, President and CEO of the National Wildlife Federation. Thank you so much for taking this conversation and broadening it uh, to this extent. Uh, I'd like to thank our attendees, our audiences, uh, also your donors, your staffs, your boards for all the work that you're doing. We are going to, on Thursday, be discussing another very important topic, which has uh, affected us in the United States so um, dramatically, uh, gun violence, uh, particularly in schools. Uh, so uh, please join us for that on Thursday. Everybody stay safe and stay healthy. Take care. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you.